Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, I would like to welcome you to Storage X International Symposium again. On behalf of my co-director, Professor Will Chair at Stanford University, um, this now becomes uh, our bi-weekly routine. We would like to welcome the people doing research, caring about the energy storage to join us again for today's uh, very exciting panel. Uh, as you all know, uh, we launched Storage X initiative at Stanford right here uh, last year. Um, since uh, about half a year ago, we launched the Storage X Symposium. The X right here means uh, uh, nearly everything related to storage. Last time, um, we have X equals to fill. Uh, in addition to uh, early events on the batteries, and today we come back to batteries again. Uh, and this time, the X uh, equals to lithium-ion battery at the terawatt-hour scale. We all know the electric cars industry are driving the whole battery industry growing very, very fast. And in a speed very likely to be in the next 10 years, we will grow, uh, grow to terawatt hour scale. That really means roughly every three years, we about double, about double our production of lithium ion batteries capacity. With this uh, uh, in mind, if you look at what's really needed for mining, for materials, from tooling, right, from uh, each component you can think about related to lithium ion batteries needs to double at that time scale. So this is really a daunting task. So Will and I feel like this is so important for us to hold a panel discussion on so today, we are so excited to have three industry leaders to join us to discuss this topic. Uh, I will pass this uh, the podium to Will. He will introduce our panelist, Will. Thank you very much, E, and uh, good morning from California as well. So as E pointed out, um, Today, we enjoy lives that run on batteries. And we're so pleased today to have these heroes and technology movers and shakers who made it happen and making it happen join us. So we have three um, speakers and participants today, all working very hard on scaling up battery technologies. So let me introduce them in the order that they will speak. So first, uh, with our colleague, uh, Heiko Ulta from BASF. He is a organic chemist uh, who received his training from the University of Heidelberg. And he joined BASF in 2002 and has been working on a range of R&D activities ranging from synthesis to catalysis. In 2018, he assumed responsibility for BSF's uh, North American bat battery business, which is headquartered in Michigan. And as of September this year, just uh, last month, he is now the head of global R&D battery materials based out of headquarter in Germany. Our second speaker is another industry veteran, uh, uh, Selena Mikwajek. And uh, she's a mechanical engineer by training, received her degree from Caltech. And she has spent the last two decades uh, in various aspects of the battery uh, supply chain. Uh, she worked at Exponent, developing failure analysis method for batteries, then at Tesla, Uber. And since 2019, she is leading the battery R&D activity at Panasonic as his VP for battery technology and at the front line in um, the Gigafactory uh, in Nevada. And finally, our third speaker is one of Stanford's most distinguished alums, J.P. Straubel. Uh, he co-founded Tesla in 2004. 
and uh, was its chief architect for the electric vehicle technology, uh, the battery subsystems, and many things. More recently, in 2017, he founded Redwood Materials to tackle another emerging uh, challenge of great importance to sustainability and to lowering the cost of battery deployment uh, in terms of material recycling. So as I said, we're so delighted to be joined by this distinguished panel who is trying to make scaling work and are scaling every day. So we're delighted um, to host everyone. So let's begin. Let me hand the mic to Heiko, who will talk about the scaling up challenges in the synthesis of cathode battery materials. Heiko, the floor is yours. All right, thanks a lot. So good morning, California. Good afternoon to Germany, Europe, and the rest of the world who is listening today. I hope you can see my screen and hear me very well. And I wanted to invite you to the roller coaster of battery industry for a chemical giant like BSF. So our roots are really in chemistry, ranging almost centuries back. And now we onboarded the journey to uh, enter the e-mobility space. And I wanted to highlight to you a little bit the challenges that we are seeing um, for the industry to really make e-mobility in special a viable technology for consumers in the end. Before I go there, I will quickly introduce what BSF is doing there and how the total market is developing, and then zoom in a little bit into the challenges of production that we see today. Great. So here we are. So for BSF, the automotive industry is really one of the key industries we are serving already today, and around about 21% of our annual revenue is related to automotive industry and all levels, for example, ranging from the coatings or the plastics, it's coolant additives, it's um, brake aids and stuff like that. And for the division I'm coming from, we are also very strong in exhaust gas catalyst business. And obviously, the more the electric cars are penetrating the market, this catalyst market is going to shrink. So for a company like BSF, it's more than natural to invest into battery material systems just to compensate for the shrinking market with something that is emerging. But also all the other segments of BSF, which are more chemistry related, are still benefiting from the e-mobility trend. For example, supplying the appropriate plastics and polymers for insulating of the cables and electronics and everything around that. BSF is focusing only on cathode active material, how we call it. And those are the nickel cobalt manganese, the NCM types, or the nickel cobalt aluminum oxides, which are used to coat the cathode of the battery. And those materials have a really tremendous impact on the cost, on the weight, on the range and the safety of your battery cell. And then in the end also to those properties of an electric car. So you really have a significant leverage of the overall performance of the car in the end, just packed in this cathode active material. And at the moment we are amongst the leaders for the high energy NCAs, for example, um, which are ranking amongst the highest nickel containing cathode material set, which you can buy today in today's market space. Important to understand that the value chain is really starting with mining operations because for the cathode materials that we are producing you need all those metals like nickel cobalt lithium manganese and this is one key driver for bsf to make sure that we are building up on the one hand a reliable supply chain for our customers and even more important a sustainable value chain and therefore all our metal providers are um, audited and we are really doing special checks with regard to sustainability from social, economic and eco-friendly perspective to make sure that we do this in the most sustainable way in the metal sourcing. And we are also closely collaborating with various metal players around the globe to look into the opportunities for the future because the metal amounts required to grow this whole market will be tremendous. But our key expertise is really around those, what we call the battery materials, the precursor production, where you precipitate um, the nickel cobalt precursors. And then the final good that BSF is selling is the chem, where you then add the lithium during a calcination. And those materials are then sold to companies 
like Panasonic here, the cell producers around the world um, that manufacture the batteries and the packs, which then eventually go into the electric cars. But this is not where VSF activity is stopping because of the tremendous demand of metals and also the sustainability aspect of the whole thing. We started the whole work stream and collaboration activities to look into the recycling of the spent batteries to ultimately get the metals back in the loop. So we are developing own tailor-made processes to really collect the batteries in the market, to dismantle them, and then ultimately to separate the lithium and also the nickel cobalt to feed it back into the production chain that eventually we have a closed loop. Obviously the whole recycling activity is a little bit delayed compared to the start of the electric mobility market as the lifetime is expected to be beyond the 10 years. So this is when then significant amount of spent batteries will come back that have to be recycled. But you have to get the value chain ready already today. So looking to the trends that are transforming the automotive industry, and this is really important to understand on how the whole market works. In the end, the consumers are expecting that also an electric car is only as expensive as an internal combustion engine driven car. And there are external trials like regulations, which are very strong in Europe and partially also in China that drive e-mobility. But if you look to markets like US, they're really the total cost of ownership is much more dominating the market penetration of electric mobility. But as you can see here in, at mid-size cars, already 2018, we were very close um, to the cost parity in the end. And electric cars already today can be very attractive for a user if you really look to the full cost of a car, including maintenance, including fuel, and including the purchase price. This all is possible as in the last couple of years, really energy density of batteries and the battery materials has been constantly increasing. And in, at the same time, the battery pack cost dropped significantly. And what you can see here is the projection here from Bloomberg we expect to reach a cost of around about $62 per kilowatt hour, around about 2020, uh, 2020, 2030, sorry. And this will lead then to a nice market ramp up of electric car penetration. This chart does not yet reflect the dip, which is caused by Corona, but also the Corona situation might even accelerate the e-mobility penetration. As you can see, for example, in Europe, there are many programs now to accelerate the market launch via additional support for the consumers to buy an electric car. What does it mean for a materials producer? If those projections become reality, you need to look at the number or the volume of battery material that will be required. And today you can buy around about, or we are producing around about 300,000 tons cathode material per year. And following the growth path here of electric cars, this will ramp up to around about 2.5 million tons of cathode material, or in gigawatt hours, around about 2,000 gigawatt hours as installed capacity. So this is a tremendous demand of material required, which in the end also need all the materials to be produced. Yeah? And Tesla announced during the battery day that there is really not sufficient speed for the battery factories for all the component suppliers to provide that growth in the end. Um, and also money-wise, huge investments, it's beyond the $2 trillion in the whole value chain are required. The good part of this whole thing, it's really a bullish and growing market which will lead to new jobs. Uh, it's lots of challenges for academia and the scientific society. And again, Corona might even accelerate the switch from combustion-driven cars into e-mobility. But how do we scale that up? And this whole thing is even more complicated as there is more and more a separation in clear market segments for better materials. And so a producer like BSF really has to make the choice where to position the resources to really capture the appropriate market trend to develop the right products and also to provide the right production capabilities in the end. And in a simplified view, you can say that you have your low range entry segment cars with, which might be used for example, for city traffic and those typically 
could be powered with LFP type cathode materials or more manganese rich cathode materials. Um, then for the luxury segment and the mid-size cars, also the mid-nickel cathode materials are applying 60 to 85% nickel contained. And then for the high performance cars, um, it's going up to 85 nickel and beyond. Ultimate target is really to reach something close to 100% nickel in the cathode material. And further complexity is arising that all the battery producers are chasing different cell formats, which in the end also require fine-tuned cathode materials that we have to provide to the cell producers in the end. So what is the, the challenge behind that? So we need to really produce huge volumes of solid powders, the cathode materials. And at the same time, you need highest quality because, for example, any impurity in your material can lead to impact of the performance in the battery cell or in the worst case, even to safety concerns. So it's really a high-tech product and synthesis in a huge scale that we have to accomplish as industry. Ideally, industry would like to use something like rotary kilns for the calcination where you mix the lithium nickel cobalt compounds. But today, this will lead to insufficient product quality. Those rotary kilns which you use in other industries, they will have corrosion issues, quality issues. So they are not yet widely used. What we are doing is really batch operations, both in the precursor synthesis, in the first step, and also in the calcination. This is really only a numbering up from a very small scale. And what you can see here is the standard roller half kiln used in the industry for the calcination. And you're filling your product that is to be calcined in those small ceramic saggers and move them slowly through the kiln in a very controlled way to make sure you have very accurate oxygen control, very accurate temperature control. And you also need to make sure that your saggers are loaded evenly. And you can imagine if you want to produce 2 million tons of material, this might be a, quite a sophisticated task. And it's really only a small step from the lab scale to this industry scale because you're just numbering up those sagger calcination. And that's for the long term when you want to be um, economically attractive, a real challenge for the industry. And to zoom in a little bit more, what is happening in a sagger? That's here a scheme showing how you can fill your sagger with material. And in the early days, we had low nickel concentration cathode materials. There you could really fill up the saggers to the, to the maximum. But now the high performance materials which are required from the market, you, are not, you can't fill them up to the limit. So the throughput of your calcination plant is even going down. And because the higher the nickel content, the more sophisticated you need to control your oxygen, the partial pressure, the mass transport, and the temperature distribution to end up with a high quality product at the end of the calcination. And as we are coming from the chemical industry, I also want to share with you a little bit of comparison on how chemical processes are typically scaled up. And here we talk of the example acrylic acid production. This is a chemical that is going, for example, into production of diapers. Yeah, that if you polymerize acrylic acid, you fill it in diapers to take up the liquids from your babies and wherever you need it. And you start with a lab scale experience, maybe 100 grams. And then you go to a pilot scale, which is maybe around about 1,000 kilogram. And then you scale up for production scale with a factor of 100,000. And acrylic acid in 2018, you had a demand of around about 7 million ton per year, which could be covered by 70 world scale chemical production sites. If you now look into the battery industry, what's happening there, so as mentioned earlier, the global demand in 2030 will be 2.5 million tons of cathode material per year. And if you take a simple kiln set up, those ro roller half kilns, which I've been showing to you earlier, they produce around about 2,000 tons per year, one single kiln. So you really need in the end to supply all that demand, over 1,000 production lines to meet that demand. So that's, that is really a tremendous effort. And Again, if you look to what other industries are doing, it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Still, it's happening at the moment. All the players around the globe are just doing nothing but numbering up. You have your lab scale experiments starting with 100 gram calcination. 
in your pilot, you're filling a full size sacker with five kilogram. And then in commercial production, you're just numbering that up and move those small saggers to the calcination kiln. The picture is not much different on the precursor side. Yeah. Also here, you're basically numbering up your precipitation rather than using large size equipment or high throughput processes. So here's a very clear need for innovative and scalable processes in the, unit, uh, in the future that we can meet the expected cost targets that eventually we all as consumers are willing to buy an electric car other than for sustainability reasons, but also for economical reasons. So to put out the challenge here for our academic audience, it's really key, at least from perspective of BSF as a materials producer, that we find new and smart approaches to allow a low cost cathode material production, which again are the key driver for performance of electric cars with regard to cost, range, lifetime and safety. And the amounts required are really tremendous. And the low cost can be tackled by, by various levels in the end. And for example, if you look into the raw material value chain, are there smarter ways rather than using high purity, battery grade raw materials, nickel, cobalt, lithium, to get to the required starting components that we would need for calcination, for example. The other point is looking more and more into the recycling opportunities for raw materials. Once the batteries are coming back, we have a raw material source where the metal concentration will be much, much higher. Yeah? But in the end, it's a very decent source of new raw material, uh, which we need to prepare already now to have it ready in maybe five to 10 years from now. But then also on the production technology, uh, I was talking from the cathode material calcination what continuous calcination technologies are out there? How can we avoid this numbering up of what we, the industry is doing today to get to a real economic process? Are there alternative killed concepts or are there even kind of direct synthesis leading you to the better material which then the cell producers can buy? So there is lots of work out there to get from the standard approach which the industry is choosing today still delivering high performance cathode materials, but in a much more economic way going forward. Um, so it's really one key task from a materials producers perspective that we are gaining a much deeper and better understanding of the calcination and also of the chemistry behind that lead to the high performance cathode materials. And this is where universities, research and academia can really support, support a lot. All right, that's all I had as a teaser for the discussion later on, and we'll hand over to um, Selina, I guess. Hi, everyone. I'm Selina Mikowajczyk. I'm a Vice President for Battery Technology and Engineering at Panasonic Energy of North America. That's the division of Panasonic that produces cells at the Gigafactory near uh, Reno, Nevada. Um, and I wanted to give you guys a sense today of what production at this scale really looks like, what it means. So this is a bit of video from the uh, Gigafactory, um, just to give you a sense of what it actually looks like, um, and some, a few shots of inside the factory. Um, this factory is immense. It produces uh, millions of cells every day. Um, when I started in the industry about 20 years ago, a factory was pretty amazing if they could produce a million cells a month, five million cells a month. That was a lot. Um, we produce those kind of numbers uh, in days at this point. Um, it's, uh, it's, an immense, it's an immense facility. Um, and it takes, it takes a lot of raw materials coming in, a lot of people to run. Um, let's see if I can get to the next slide. Here we go. Um, it's also not, uh, not the same size and not the same picture that I showed on the first slide, which was the conceptual size of the factory. In fact, at the moment, the Gigafactory sits on about 30% uh, of its original planned footprint, um, and Panasonic occupies about two-thirds of that footprint. Um, and inside there, uh, we've achieved about 35 gigawatt, gigawatt hours per year production or more. 
Um, this looks a little bit, uh, you know, like, okay, is it really that big? What you have to understand is you're looking at a three-story high factory, and actually they're three tall stories, so it's more something like a six-story factory um, divided into three floors. Um, so this is a very, very big facility. And to give you a sense of the timeline for this facility, um, groundbreaking, or we started, groundbreaking started in 2014. Uh, Panasonic started equipment installation at the very end of 2015 and the first cell mass production at the very beginning of 2017. Uh, that was on a single line. Um, and uh, as construction continued, we were producing cells while uh, the factory was being constructed around us, which had significant challenges. Um, and uh, we kept adding lines and, and additional lines. Um, achieved, you know, 100 million cell shipment in 2018. And 100 million cells is like a, you know, it's a big milestone. Um, a lot of factories, you know, that would be years of production, many years of production. Um, and this was done within about a year. Um, the first billionth cell was shipped in February 2019. And uh, despite, you know, COVID, um, we shipped our three billionth cell in August of this year which gives you a sense of how, um, how many cells are produced and how big this factory actually has to be to do that. So where does this come from? Um, you don't just kind of create this kind of factory in the first go. Um, Panasonic itself has a hundred year history of cell making. And what does that mean? Um, well, you know, the hundred years ago, Panasonic was making uh, little bicycle lamps with the batteries to power them. Um, very different chemistry. Lithium ion turns out to be the latest in a long line of chemistries that Panasonic has uh, produced in, in reasonably high volumes. Maybe not quite at gigafactory volumes until now, but in, in substantial volumes. And what does that mean? That means that um, you don't have to reinvent absolutely everything when you go and build a, a, something like the gigafactory. Um, you uh, evolve um, designs and you evolve them from previous chemistries. Um, the little alkaline cells that Panasonic used to make were cylindrical. And so, you know, Panasonic knows how to handle cylindrical cells um, and is known for a long time. And then you also evolve it from the most recent factories. So when I first started in the industry in about 2000, I was able to go see Panasonic's early lines with lithium ion lines in, uh, in Japan. And then when I was at Tesla, I went back and started seeing more lines and commissioning more lines in Japan and got to see a few different factories. And it was kind of interesting because I could see how the equipment had evolved along different um, design lines itself within the different factories as I went from some of the oldest factories to the newest factories. Um, and the Gigafactory itself is really, you know, uh, the latest factory of lithium ion cells. There's about seven previous factories in Japan and China that Panasonic had that produce lithium ion cells. So there's a lot of learning uh, embodied in this factory. How do, we, how do we work at Panasonic? Um, the cell R&D, the materials development, um, supply chain development and so forth is handled by our teams in Japan. They have been doing this for quite some time. Um, so they lead all of that. And then what happens is uh, these cell designs are, and, and new equipment are brought to Pena and our engineering teams lead the final cell and equipment design validations, which often means that we're making adjustments to all of those designs to allow them to run at the high volumes, high scale that we have at Panasonic or at Pena. And that's different than we see in Japan. So we will see, um, see equipment and we'll see cell designs that work fantastic in the lab. They work very well in smaller scale factories. Um, and then we bring them to Pena and we start looking at ramping them to the speeds that we run at and the scale we run at, and suddenly, you know, we discover some things, and we need to uh, meet, need to make the adjustments. Work with the Japan teams to make the adjustments to deliver the uh, final product at the volumes that our customer needs. Um, this is this is really important. It's important that the factory be deeply involved in the iteration process on the design side, both the cell side and the process equipment, because it's it's just hard for people. Even you know, people are working in a factory in Japan. Um, it's a, real, it's a real factory, it's a fantastic factory, it's big, 
but they don't quite understand or quite can envision all the difficulties that occur when you're at even bigger scale. And you can kind of intellectually know it, but until you've really seen it and been in them in that mix, or even tested your equipment and tested your designs in that process equipment, you don't actually know um, what it's gonna what it's gonna turn out like. So we see a lot of those challenges. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Pena was designed to really take advantage of all the previous technology that uh, Panasonic had, um, but it is uh, unique. The, the equipment that's in uh, Pena is really larger and faster than anything uh, that Panasonic has had built anywhere. Um, to give you a sense too, uh, there are eight coding lines inside the Gigafactory. So that means eight coders running cathode, eight coders running anode. A uh, typical factory that I had visited prior, uh, prior to being at Panasonic, one coding line is a lot. You know, you, that's, you get one good coding line and you run a bunch of assembly lines off of it and that's great. We've got eight. That means that we've got 32 die heads um, because you coat top, top and bottom of the, uh, the electrode. Um, and then downstream of that, press machines and slitters. Um, these are all running 24 seven every day. Um, those coding lines feed at present 13 assembly lines. Um, these assembly lines, uh, I think the first assembly line has some of the same equipment that we had in our uh, most up-to-date factory in Japan. And then since that, it's all new and evolved equipment, um, including three high-speed lines. Um, this is just shy of 200 winding machines. Um, I'm not sure how much, how many of the audience have seen a winding machine before. It's a intensely complex piece of equipment that brings anode, cathode, separator together, welds all the tabs on the cell, puts on the tapes and winds everything up into a jelly roll. And, um, you know, these things have, uh, well, they're daunting if you stand in front of one. Um, so we have 200 of those, just shy. Um, and then there's also all the lines that support, uh, support these things. There's 13 top cap production lines. So the top cap that goes on the cell, yeah, we, we press that, we make that. And we have to make that um, in time for our assembly lines. And then seven formation lines. Um, that's where we do charge discharge and testing of cells. Again, to give you a sense of scale, um, you know, cells, when they're made, they go into a formation tray. Formation tray goes into the um, charge discharge equipment. We fill 19,000 formation trays per day. Um, it, trying to think about where you would just put 19,000 of anything is daunting um, and realize that you know, we, we do this every day. And formation um, is a process where uh, you, you count the formation process lasting in terms of days and weeks. So you can imagine how much whip we have to manage um, if we're filling 19,000 trays per day, okay? At the same time, you know, these are all daunting, they're super hard, but these are the things that really enable um, price reductions. This is what economy of scale means. It doesn't just mean that you're buying all of your raw materials in huge quantities. It also means you're buying your equipment in large quantities. You're buying the spare parts for that equipment in large quantities. And um, you have to just have processes that will enable you to maintain this equipment um, that's running, as I said, 24 seven, uh, 365 days a year. Um, you have to maintain these things and keep them running. Some new, new things where, um, adding our fourth cell assembly line at Pena. Um, that's going to be even more advanced generation equipment. We've begun construction on that and that equipment is starting to land soon. Um, and we continue to evolve these, uh, evolve our equipment. We're always pushing to the higher production speeds, um, more and more automation because uh, you can imagine it takes a lot of people to run this factory. There are thousands of people inside Pena every day. Um, and you, you can't sustain just kind of growing a city you have to uh, try and automate. Um, and then you have to use big data to look at this. If you've got close to 200 winding machines, how do you know which ones are working well and which ones are not? You, you can't, on this scale, you can't look across a factory floor and say, things are going well, except over there. It, there's, there's no looking across the factory floor. You have to get into the data to take a look at your um, equipment and equipment efficiency. Um, with regards to people, as I said, there are thousands of people in the factory every day. Um, and uh, we're in Reno, Nevada. Um, it's not until the Gigafactory came, uh, batteries were not a thing, okay? Um, even manufacturing was really um, 
not something that was um, being done at a substantial scale in, in this area. So how do we do that? Um, well, we've had to focus pretty heavily on people development, and that means a lot of things. Um, we have to do a lot of training. We have to teach everyone how to, um, how to work with you know, this incredibly complex, massive equipment. Um, and you know, some folks are coming into, into our gigafactory, they're coming from the hospitality industry and you sit them in front of you know, a winder or you sit them in a coding booth and say, okay, go. <laughs> and people will like look at this and think, oh my God, I can't do this. But we teach people how to do this. Uh, so we train technically, we train on leadership skills. Uh, there's continuous coaching. Um, our colleagues come from Japan and they teach local members and uh, we're not just sending engineers from Japan or bringing engineers from Japan. We bring operators from Japan to treat, um, teach our operating operator teams, people who do maintenance. Um, those folks are coming over from Japan to teach, teach our, uh, you know, all our workers. And then um, we have to develop, uh, we had to develop a high performance culture approach that, that helps systematize how people work together, how people learn and um, how we bring up information from the floor. Because again, you know, you've got thousands of people. There's just no way that um, as a manager, you can walk around and touch everyone, see everyone and ask them how their day is. Um, you have to really uh, bring that up from a culture perspective. Um, the engineering staffing needs is also difficult. Um, again, this is a very growing industry um, and there's just not, uh, there's not really strong programs or you know, programs that are focused, at, especially at the undergraduate level on batteries, okay? Uh, this is not a traditional discipline. Um, there's no single right discipline in the US that we're gonna recruit from either. Um, and of course, uh, you know, uh, we hire a lot of engineers. So 95% of our hires have never really had any battery industry experience. Um, in many cases, we're lucky if, uh, um, if folks have seen batteries in the lab, we're like, woohoo, great, right? Um, so we look for candidates that are really um, comfortable working across traditional engineering disciplines because when you look at battery, when you look at production, you know, you've got a, a You've got uh, chemical processes going on in the factory. You've got mechanical processes going on in the factory. You've got a whole lot of controls and engineering, um, electrical engineering, things that you have to think about. There's a lot of uh, statistical analysis and so forth. So we really hire from diverse educational backgrounds, also diverse industrial backgrounds, because again, we're looking at people that know chemical processing, people know mechanical systems. Um, and then also diverse personal backgrounds. Um, and we find that's really good for um, creating new ideas and challenging the idea, oh, well, we've always done it this way. Nice thing about Panasonic having a hundred year history, there's a lot to draw on. At the same time, it's really great to have people coming from different backgrounds who say, oh, but in my other industry, we did something a different way, or have you thought about doing this another way? And, and that kind of challenge and tension is, is very good. So some of the, cell innovation roadmaps. Um, right now, uh, we're converting lines to increase energy density. Um, it's, a, it's a great new cell that's, that's going to be ready soon. Um, it's got excellent fast charge performance with that increased energy density, which is um, really exciting. Uh, we have a roadmap for continued cobalt reduction, um, and we do plan on ultimately a cobalt-free design. That's uh, difficult, but we think we can achieve it shortly. Um, and then, uh, you know, continued increase in energy density. Uh, for for our chemistries, and finally, um, one of the one of the other innovative things that we've been doing at the factory that um, is a great deal of fun is that we've begun a partnership with Redwood Materials in uh, Carson, um, uh, JB's company, and uh, Redwood is taking over recycling our typical factory valuable waste. This would be things like uh, coated electrode that scrap. Um, jelly rolls that are rejected, um, don't go into cans, and then waste cells. Um, our yields and our production processes are very good, but everything's kind of giga at the gigafactory. So, um, you know, we have a very small scrap rate, but in actual scale, in actual tonnage, it's a pretty daunting amount of material. Um, so we're really glad to be working with someone to recover that very effectively. Um, and then, you know, we were also trying to develop some processes that would just recycle waste that would be um, typically uh, classified as hazardous and would require um, 
uh, disposal, for example, landfilling or um, uh, incineration. So we're excited to do that too, because we think that has some real possibilities to um, recover a lot of those materials and uh, bring our price down, our cost down substantially. And then of course, uh, we're working um, together and we're hoping that um, Redwood can develop some uh, processes so that we can uh, return a lot of those materials and uh, also the materials coming from the um, consumer electronics side of recycling back into the battery supply chain. And of course, obvious, the obvious ones there are copper, cobalt, nickel, and lithium. So, um, so that's, uh, that's, a, that's a great bit of the future. And you know, we look at this as recycling being an important part of um, reducing our cell bomb cost over the long term. And that gives you a sense of what we're doing. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Selena, uh, for the introduction to the cell, the, the challenge right there. Uh, next, we will have JB to come, to come to the podium to tell us about the recycling. Uh, uh, JB will not use slide, but JB, you can just feel free to, to share what, what's in your mind. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Yi, and uh, uh, hello, everyone, to all the different time zones. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and have a chance to share some thoughts. Um, you know, of course, the majority of my, uh, my career was spent, uh, you know, in the EV market and at Tesla. And, you know, I uh, you know, was you know, one of the co-founders there back all the way into 2003 and 2004 as we started to ramp. And, you know, it was just an, an amazing, you know, adventure watching, you know, how fast the EV, you know, e-mobility market has, has developed. I think it's it's hard to even remember, you know, the, these times 15 years ago when, you know, electric vehicles were, were, you know, not not even close to mainstream, you know, and and really most people didn't expect that they would, you know, take on any significant market share. It was more focused on fuel cells and and HEV. So you know, it's it, it's pretty amazing, I think, and really um, wonderful to see the fact that, you know, sustainability and e-mobility has. You know, accelerated to the extent it has, um, but you know, for for me through that whole time, you know, it it was becoming increasingly clear that, you know, we we kept moving some of the challenges further upstream, and you know, the scale of the entire automotive industry and the scale of, you know, the energy industry, you know, to some extent as well, um, needed to uh, support that whole uh, change, you know, is just massive and. You know, on a personal note, you know, I, I remember, you know, way back in, in school, I always uh, was kind of lamenting, in engineering school, I was kind of lamenting the fact that, uh, you know, it felt like all the big innovations had already happened and, you know, we, we kind of missed the time when, you know, the, the Edisons and the Nikola Teslas of the world got to invent, you know, a whole ecosystem or the, the Daimlers or Fords um, got to invent a whole industrial ecosystem. And, you know, it, it turns out that, you know, we're actually, I think, you know, living in almost exactly the same sort of time in, in this generation of engineers and scientists and, you know, industrialists um, who get to architect, you know, a whole new industrial system for sustainability. And, you know, it's, it's just been, you know, such a, a, a fun and, and wonderful, um, you know, uh, thing to be a part of and, and, a, and a wonderful journey. Um, you know, but as I said, you know, at, at Tesla, especially as we, you know, got into ramping uh, the Gigafactory type of scale and, and going from Model S to Model 3 and, and beyond, you know, it, it really was clear that, you know, this challenge was continually moving further upstream. And, um, you know, one way to look at that is just, you know, seeing, seeing the incredible focus, you know, shifting toward, um, you know, the, the cost of the materials that go into the products. And if you look at an electric vehicle versus an internal combustion vehicle, the, the big change in that whole supply chain, you know, it kind of obvious, but it, it points straight into the battery. And within the battery, you know, so much of that goes into the, the active materials, as, as Heiko and, and Selena pointed out, you know, that, that make that up. You know, today, um, you know, there's varying different numbers, but, you know, the, the percent of the bill of materials cost um, you know, what that represents of the percent of a whole cell cost, you know, is surprisingly high. You know, it's, it's more than 50% in almost every case, and maybe, you know, closer to 75%. You 
in, in some really high volume cases where you know, factories have, have done a, an excellent job at reducing the assembly cost of all those materials and reducing the manufacturing and the labor and energy. But it, it pushes more of the problem toward the bill of materials and toward, and even toward the, the commodities that go into those, uh, you know, fundamental engineered materials. So for me, seeing that trend was really exciting and, and interesting, but also laid out a pretty clear challenge um, for where, you know, I, I was excited to focus. Um, and personally, I'm, you know, I'm, I'd say, you know, 50% uh, entrepreneur and 50% and engineer inventor, and um, just really love building teams, you know, building technologies and, and uh, innovation. And, you know, Tesla has, uh, you know, grown to, to such a, an amazing scale, it's incredible to see, um, you know, but it, it is, a, you know, needing a little bit of a different focus, uh, especially in some of, you know, the, the leadership at, at the top levels. And for me, you know, I, I'm actually having, you know, an incredibly fun time and, and uh, really enjoying, you know, building a, a new small company and building, um, you know, the foundation of, for a technology uh, for something that, you know, I see as inevitable in the future that we have to, you know, put more focus on. And, you know, to turning to Redwood uh, more specifically, you know, our, our mission is, is kind of threefold, you know, on the front end of our business, you know, we focus on, you know, appropriate uh, disposal, um, you know, avoidance of kind of all the negative effects uh, that happen or could happen at the end of life with batteries if they're not handled appropriately. And again, that was a challenge we struggled with at Tesla. There weren't that many, you know, very um, robust, you know, well-developed companies in the space. There weren't many technologies to handle that. And, you know, it tended to become a high cost uh, and a high fee, you know, to handle that very appropriately at the end of life. So at the front end of our business, you know, that we're making sure that, that batteries don't create a negative effect at end of life. But it can go much further beyond that. And, you know, not only is it not negative, but it, it can be a very positive, um, you know, cost benefit to the battery cost structure. So, in the middle of our business, we're, we're focusing on, um, similar to what BASF and, and Heiko touched on, we're focusing on, you know, materials recovery and reprocessing. So taking these valuable raw materials and, you know, basically inventing and improving the ways to most efficiently recover them and, and very directly move them back into, uh, you know, the right quality and consistency of compounds that can be reintroduced to the supply chain. And then on the, the, the final side of the business, we're, we're looking at, you know, kind of merging these different uh, pieces of technology together so that we can, you know, find ways to more efficiently and more cheaply, you know, go from basically an old battery to the components that make up a new battery. And today this is very, um, very uh, siloed and very discreet. And, you know, people break this into many different, you know, companies and processes and, and it's also scattered all around the world in a very efficient way, inefficient way. You know, these materials, you know, take an incredible journey, uh, you know, physically throughout their lifetime. They, they might get mined in, you know, some part of the Pacific or Asia or Siberia and, and then move thousands of kilometers, you know, to a place where they're refined and then thousands more to where they get made into uh, battery materials, then again into cells. Then they live as an electric vehicle or a, a device, and then they kind of retrace that entire journey through through some of their recycling pathways today. So there's a great opportunity to vertically integrate some of that, to compress that physical supply chain, and and to overlap some of the chemical and manufacturing processes to save, you know, a great deal of cost and and um, and just repackaging uh, efforts where you know something is done and then undone. But you know this this is an interesting industry because um, you know I, I, again I think Heiko pointed out the the scale challenge you know very clearly you know it, it's being pressed on one side by an incredible need to ramp you know to these you know massive massive scales uh, to satisfy the automotive growth and on the other hand you know trying to innovate and figure out how to you know invent new processes and push innovation in at the same time as scaling um, you know at a breakneck pace. So it, it, it really is, um, I mean, it's a lot of fun from an engineering point of view. And I think, uh, you know, it's a very fascinating blend of process engineering and 
and industrial automation and controls and data, um, along with you know, chemical engineering, chemistry, and R&D, you know, working very tightly beside each other. Um, and that's, that's the, the team that we're building today at Redwood. You know, we, um, you know, we're already recycling you know, a great deal of material uh, in North America and um, you know, focusing today on uh, both the production uh, you know, fallout and production uh, waste material uh, that Selena mentioned from Panasonic and, and others, but also on consumer devices. And that's a market that's been you know, much more stable in its uh, volumes for the past you know, several years and also has a shorter lifetime. You know, so the, it, it's, uh, it, it's more of a um, you know, closed loop system already, or it should be. So you know, we're receiving you know, surprisingly large amounts you know, of consumer electronics device batteries and materials and can reprocess those and um, basically you know, upgrade them into you know, more advanced chemistries and, and better use some of the materials like cobalt to allow them to build actually more um, of a modern chemistry of battery. So that uh, you know, today is, is where we're focusing and um, you know, definitely, you know, growing the team quickly and, um, you know, anyone, uh, you know, with a, the passion for, for some of these topics, you know, recycling, uh, process engineering, chemical engineering, automation, you know, we, we'd love to hear from you and, um, you know, love to, uh, you know, talk to you about possibly joining the team. So with that, uh, maybe I'll, I'll wrap up here and leave a bit of more time for the panel and Q&A. Well, thank you, JB. Uh, this is uh, very exciting to, to learn about. Let me uh, bring back all the panelists. Uh, we could uh, spend the next good part of uh, about an hour to uh, have a discussion. Uh, maybe I will kick off uh, the, with the first question. You know, from Heiko to Selena, JB to you, uh, three of us give us an overview of from materials to sell and to recycling. And uh, we keep hearing about, of course, that's today's topic, scaling. Scaling is so important. I, I remember when I joined in Stanford faculty 15 years ago, in the Silicon Valley right here, center around Stanford, have been talking about innovation. Like there's all this cool IT technology uh, coming. Well, Tesla at the time just started not too long, like a, a small startup. And people don't, talk too much about scaling. I mean, this is scaling issue in IT industry as well, but, but not a whole lot. They don't mention that innovation is on the, all those cool ideas. And, and then the whole energy space, clean energy sustainability come. Now scaling becomes so important. I see knowing how to scaling by itself is already a huge innovation. Scaling is the innovation right here we are talking about. Um, so with this background kicking off, I want to ask the first question. I, I, when I listen to three of your talks, right, I, I have the feeling we are doing scaling so fast. It's like running really, really fast, right? A hundred meter dash. But at the same time, you still need to do innovation. Scaling and doing your technology innovation. If you think, think about hundred meter, a dash. It's like you're running so fast, but at the same time, you're ch changing the style of how you run. That's very hard. Uh, would you like to share with us, you know, scaling and innovation along the way, <laughs> you know, that battery material, the new recipe come, coming in, right? And the cell manufacturing, Selena, I haven't seen the, you know, gigafactory type of battery manufacturing yet. You know, you need to do how, know how to do changing and your manufacturing and all of the cell. Oh, yeah. and, and JB as well, in your case, you know, uh, you are doing recycling. I assume, you know, this, you're building up this uh, a process bigger and bigger. So how do we think about innovation and scaling at the same time? I, I, maybe uh, uh, Selena, you want to take it first and Heiko and also JB can make comments. Yeah, sure. Uh, my engineers work a lot, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the thing about scaling and innovation, um, when you're scaling manufacturing systems, um, it's helpful if you're actually working on those production lines. Um, my, my engineers work, um, spend a lot of time on the production lines. Even I get onto production lines occasionally, which is, you know, vaguely terrifying for my engineers. Um, but, uh, 
you know, you have to be there in the space. When you are there in the space, you realize um, what's difficult, right? And it's not obvious. It's not something that, um, you know, you look and you say, oh, um, you know, on my cell assembly line, you know, I've got my equipment and it's doing these things and I'm, um, you know, I've got the jelly roll and I put it in the can and I weld my tabs and then I fill it and then I close it and then I crimp it and, you know, and it goes on and on and on. And you're like, oh, you know, I should obviously work on one of these pieces of equipment to scale. Funny thing is when you actually work in manufacturing, you realize how long you spend cleaning, for example, the filling electrolyte filling machine. Turns out electrolyte, um, a salt inside a solvent, um, you know, everything looks perfect and, all, and good, and except that once you run a filling machine for a few days, you find all the salt crystallization on all the different components, right? And if you've got uh, crystallized salt on all your components, you're not going to fill very effectively. The seals that you're using to fill are, are going to be bad and so forth. So you'll run into problems. So you have to clean that machine. What does that mean? That means someone puts on a full, you know, papper, a, pure, a, a powered purifying, a respirator, it's this whole hood, climbs in the machine, starts pulling things apart and then having to clean this stuff. And you realize, actually, um, if I'm going to scale, I need to automate the cleaning process. Mm. Okay. I don't need to worry so much about, you know, the dynamics of electrolyte filling. Yeah, I can worry about that. You know, can I film, can I film my uh, jelly roll? What's the uptake into the cell? You know, can I speed that up a little bit? Sure, you can, and that's an important um, thing to study. But your operational um, efficiency for that equipment, how many filling machines you need, what the uptime on that equipment is going to be, is now suddenly dependent on how fast you can clean that equipment, right? And that's, like I said, it doesn't come from, the, it doesn't come from an academic study. It doesn't come from looking at, oh, this is my process. It comes from being on the production line, looking at this going, wow, we're spending a lot of time cleaning, <laughs> right <laughs> and it's so not sexy the machine we've got to automate cleaning very sexy right but you know the original problem is uh you know you think how hard could this be it's actually really hard right so that's that's kind of you know how do you drive that innovation well a bunch of my engineers working electrolyte line were like this is awful <laughs> this is the worst job in the factory we need to automate it it's, it's amazing to learn hi Paul, do you have yeah. something to share <laughs> Yeah, I can absolutely second what Selena just said, right? Also for the cathode production, it's, it's very similar. And just one simple example, if you want to do a production transfer of a lab recipe, first you produce an NCA nickel cobalt aluminum, and next week R&D wants to run a trial on nickel cobalt manganese. You have to clean the plant really, really in a sophisticated way that you're not contaminating your commercial NCA product with the manganese. Yeah? So also in our area, this, this cleaning task is really a big challenge. And obviously the plant wants to avoid that in the end. And it's the constant battle between research development and operations to, to launch new products. And it's getting even more challenging as we are looking for step change innovation also in the process technology, right? But then you're invested in production equipment and research is constantly looking for new ways to produce. But then you have put all your capital in, in certain production equipment. So that's the usual challenge to manage kind of development and breakthrough innovation. You know? And you also need to keep that separate in, in the head somehow, that you are open-minded enough to find those new leads. But at the same time, try to make use of what you already invested, right? To make use of your assets. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lot of challenges and I think battery industry is a roller coaster um, to get all this managed in a fast way because at the same time the industry is really looking for highly innovative materials so the capacities, capacities need to go up, safety requirements are increasing, lifetime requirements are increasing so we need new materials and this is only possible with R&D um, but it's, it's a big challenge. Thanks, Heiko. JV? Well, I, I just, I totally agree with uh, the general, you know, the, the premise here. I mean, it, it's, in, uh, you know, innovation is, is really, you know, targeted in this case so much at scaling. And, um, you know, I, I think people often underappreciate, you know, how hard that is and, and just how, how challenging and, and technically complex it is to, to run these facilities at scale and do that well and, 
continuously. Um, and I, I think this is a great forum to help kind of highlight that, uh, you know, into the academic you know, community, uh, you know, a bit more strongly and into the, you know, the, the to students as well. Um, you know, the, these are where, you know, probably more than half of the, the really meaty technical challenges exist, you know, in industry right now. And, um, and I think it's also important to, to kind of realize that it, it is also very directly tied to the mission of, of this whole movement. And, you know, I mean, we're, we're ultimately trying to do something to solve sustainability here. You know, that, that's one of the, the big pushes for e-mobility in the first place and, you know, why the demand for batteries is higher. But to make a big difference there, we have to achieve scale. So, you know, we're kind of forced, you know, to, uh, to really, you know, apply innovation at this incredible scale. Um, you know, it, it's not enough just to, to sort of solve something in the lab, you know, if you don't see a very clear and very fast pathway, you know, to, you know, literally today, almost gigawatt hour scale. You know, there, there's, there's so many examples from as we were ramping Model 3 that were, you know, quite entertaining in the factory of, you know, great concepts our engineering teams had that just turned into an absolute nightmare in practice. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah, Lee is laughing, but uh -huh. I mean, yeah. you, you almost can't of that. Out, you know, it's like robots throwing batteries and spraying glue and, you know, it just, <laughs> you, know, you think everything is, is organized and perfect and, you know, big professional company, it must be, you know, really, really nailed down. But you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's a lot of engineers trying to, you know, make complicated machines work and solve problems, you know, even, even at the biggest scale. Um, so. Yeah, thank you, JB. I'll pass that now the podium to uh, Will. Will will have question to, uh, to ask. Actually, let me jump in and, and build on this topic. I, I think it's really important to learn about these push and pulls, right? So E talked about um, the sort of, the challenges between choosing, innovating the technology, and of course, continue to scaling and innovating the, the manufacturing. Um, I'm actually curious here. So, Selena, you, you mentioned a couple of keywords. Uh, you mentioned the scaling laws, um, you know, the use of drop-in uh, technology changes versus massively revamping the production line. Uh, JB, you talked about you know, using recycled materials um, uh, as, uh, as uh, initial reactants for making new materials. So I think that makes me think of qualification, right? So you're qualifying recycled materials. And all these, for, for my, you know, ivory tower are risks, right? So um, if you want to massively change the production line, something might not work, there is monetary risk. If you are taking on an unknown new supplier or taking on recycled material, it has to be qualified and that's cost. So how do you see, what's the decision-making process? When, when do I go between, okay, I'm just gonna rip out the production line and make a new one versus okay, I'm just gonna tweak the composition by 2% so I can drop it in. Um, you know, when do I go to a new material supplier that could be better and take on the risk? So how, what, what's the calculus there in your minds? Um, I'd love to hear from everybody now. Yeah. JB, do you wanna go first? Uh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a ton of balancing factors there and it, it's really, you know, a complicated uh, decision. Uh, you know, there, there's also all the, the capital and the, the sort of, you know, time cost of, of ramping these things. You know, it, it, it takes an incredibly long time to actually just physically build um, some of these pieces of equipment. So, <laughs> you know, that, that also can enter dramatically into your, your decision about, you know, how much innovation to push into a process or when to, to make a dramatic change to a process, because you may end up, you know, missing, you know, missing the boat on when a certain material is needed or missing a boat on, on the whole ramp up of a, of a, you know, factory or a product. Um, so I, I mean, I think that that balancing of risk and cost and innovation is, you know, sort of central to, to um, you know, how to do really good engineering and, and management of these different projects. It's, it's one that probably doesn't get taught enough because it, it, you know, it's really tempting to just sort of pick the best technology ideal and you can optimize that in, in a vacuum, but you know, it almost never is the right answer. You know, you, you need to find and balance a lot of other trade-offs. Um, you know, the validation on some of those materials, just to touch on that very quickly, 
you know, it, it depends, you know, a lot on, on, on sort of where you, where you go and reintroduce these materials back into a known process. And, you know, we spend quite a bit of time looking creatively at, you know, what is the right place, um, you know, to, to reinsert materials so that we can minimize validation. And, you know, making things that look familiar enough that, you know, they don't require a really unique process. You know, and in recycling, for instance, there's, you know, so-called direct recycling, where you try and kind of refurbish a cathode material and then rebuild a battery with it. This sounds very, you know, appealing, you know, intellectually and, you know, from an energy point of view, it looks great. From a validation and risk point of view, it's awful. And, you know, I, I don't see that scaling very quickly, you know, as a result. So that, that's one concrete example. And maybe I can, can jump in here. Requalification is really a big challenge and it, it happens everywhere, right? I mean, even if you want to switch your raw material source, you typically have to requalify with, in our case, with the cell customer, because you need to make sure that you're really meeting the right performance in the end, safety-wise, capacity-wise. And talking of raw materials, small impurities can make a huge difference in the end in the performance. Or knowing from own experience when we are transferring from our plant in Japan to the production plant in the US, even in those cases, our customers are expecting a full requalification. Despite the fact that the kilns are basically identical, right? But still you need to go through the full process and this is time consuming, it's, it's lots of cost and in the end, also risk for the industry. And if you then have a real generation change in your material, that then you really have a full blown requalification that is required. Huh? So it's, it's really important to understand that. Yeah, there's also ways to mitigate that, those kind of risks, right? So a lot of times you talk about scale and you wanna have really big equipment, right? And you do but it's really helpful to have multiple copies of that same equipment, right? So when we go and we're saying we're gonna convert lines, right? We, there's 13 assembly lines. You don't take them all down at the same time, right? You take one down, you convert, you keep the others running. There's no, like doing an all stop in a factory at scale, by the way, is really hard. Like all stops are, we've done one in the entire history of the Gigafactory it was for COVID. It took us a month to stop the factory. We were down for two weeks and another month to restart it, right? You don't do all stops. So you wanna have your, um, you wanna set up your equipment, you wanna set up your design so you have some flexibility to try things, right? If I wanna try a new um, uh, graphite, okay, I'm not gonna put it on all eight lines at once. We'll take down one line, we'll clean it, we'll run, run graphite on one line. It's an eighth of our production capability, okay. But from our customer's perspective, you know, we're still, mo we're still producing the bulk of that, that our, our commitment, right? And we're looking at what our customer's um, demand is as well and saying, okay, when can I afford to take a line down, still meet my customer's demand plan and, you know, do some trials. If everything goes well, it's awesome. But if things go pear-shaped and I have to say, you know, we're going to cut that trial or we're going to go back and, we're, and go back to the previous style. I have to have that capability. It's the same with, you know, other pieces of equipment on an assembly line. You can build an assembly line that's fully integrated, all one piece, and it's all going down the line. Great. It's a lot easier if you have some unique parts that you say, okay, I'm going to try and, try and swap a process out. Maybe I put some extra space on my line so I can run, uh, you know, I can run a bypass line from assembly. So I take it out of one piece of equipment, run it through my trial piece of equipment, put it back on the line. If it works well, I'll pull out the old piece of equipment, reinstall it so that it sits nicely. If it doesn't work well, I'll just turn it off and go and trial again and, and come back and try when I, when I have something better. So, you know, you, you partition your factory and your plant so that you cut down on the risk and give yourself the space for that innovation and the ability to try some new things. So, Will, do you want to ask a question or you want me to? All right, Eve, back to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So, um, I have uh, a few more detailed questions. Uh, maybe we'll do kind of like speed dating question, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, I think one question is, uh, feel free if you think it's in your domain and then you, you want to answer, I, I, I think that, that should be great. I, I can see some of the questions still can, uh, can cause multiple people. 
So one question about purity. We, we mentioned purity. I, I think for materials, Heiko, right, for recycling. And uh, I think Heiko, in your presentation, you mentioned can we use metallurgical gray or silicon input, uh, sorry, the, uh, the raw materials input right, to, to do things. I'm doing that process, I'm thinking, do you see a need, well, mostly for Heiko and JB, I'm right, doing recycling as well. For example, you purify lithium, you purify cobalt, and come up with a method that could purify this with a lower cost, with scale. And, and there, did you see such a need right there? Is the current technology sufficient and to it's, get you to the uh, purity? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a relatively easy answer. If you consider only talking of the cathode active material, majority of the cost is just the nickel, cobalt, and lithium, right? And this is largely driven by the, the publicly listed um, prices built by demand and supply in, in the market. And in the end, those prices are also built up on the cost the mining industry and the refining industry has ultimately, right? And the purer your raw material would be, the, the higher the cost is. And if you take, for example, nickel sulfate crystals, they have highest purity, they have um, significant manufacturing costs to produce the crystals. So if you can get around that, that's already the first step to take out cost. Um, on the further down in the mining stream you get, the better it would be for the cost situation in the end. Uh, so definitely, yes. Mm -hmm. I think an interesting problem is that, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be a great understanding of, of which impurities and which concentrations have the biggest impact on cell performance. And you know, I, I think, you know, you know, often the answer is just, you know, keep the impurities low, keep everything low, you know, and, and uh, you know, that, that's an easy answer and it's the kind of, you know, low risk answer, but it's also the most expensive answer. So, you know, that, that could be an interesting area for, I think, a lot deeper understanding on some of this, you know, it, it's horribly complex though, because you have, you know, the periodic table of stuff that can get in there and then you have to kind of sweep, you know, elements and concentrations and maybe there's combinations of elements that are worse than the sum of the parts. So, you know, that, that I'd say is kind of at the frontier of people's really, you know, good understanding of, of what purity is required. L let me jump Let's... in here, actually, uh, Heiko and JB, if I could. So, you, you mentioned um, battery grade and, and E mentioned metallurgical grade. So can you give us a sense of the history, how battery grade was decided uh, that, you know, this 99.X percent purity, um, and is, is this still valid? Um, are people trying to push it down and say, okay, maybe 99.1% is acceptable, JB, this is to your point. Um, is this just a a standard that there is and the industry has been operating around it or if this is a moving target all the time? I, I think it's a blend of various things. I mean, if you do research, you typically start your, with your chemicals from Sigma Aldrich or something like that. Yeah, highest purity. And then you start working from that. And then nobody dares to deviate from that typically, right? Obviously in industry, you try to directly jump to more industrial grade but especially for cathode materials, and it applies for the other components to a large extent as well, there are elements that are known to impact the electrochemistry negatively, right? And unluckily, a large part of the periodic table <laughs> causes some issues, so you really need to be careful here. Uh, it can be magnetic impurities leading to short circuits, but, but even standard things like magnesium or or silicon or whatever could be an impact of on, on the electrochemical performance, sometimes beneficial mm -hmm. and sometimes adversely. And it's, it's time consuming to really study this in a systematic way and yeah, that you really have the full understanding. And then there can be different species even. And yeah, it's, it's a huge field for research in the end to get a good understanding. Yeah, yeah. The, other, the other piece of it is when we're talking about electric vehicles, we're looking at eight year, 10 year lifetimes we want on those batteries. You want to make something for a cell phone. Okay, it's going to have a three year life, right? And it's not that expensive, right? I mean, not really. You want to put a pack into your car and then you want to replace it because, oops, didn't realize that <laughs> little contaminant was going to mess you up at year five or year seven. That's, that's a heck of an expense, right? So um, just running out the cycle testing on some of these things, right? You're going to say, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to allow higher concentration in my NCA 
of this, this uh, mineral and you want to do some accelerated testing, you might be th three years doing that accelerated testing, at which point your recipe for your MCA has changed. And now you got to start again. Yeah, Selena, I think you're really pointing out another key challenge, which is the qualification time after you have taken the new materials or whatever. And, um, and I guess this is the, uh, the curse of the batteries that they work so well. Well, so, so yeah, they have in most cases, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, uh, I mean, the, the current state of the art is, is, is actually is very, very good. And I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, we're seeing that it's good enough to, to already make, you know, these incredibly compelling products. And, you know, that's what pushes our problem more towards scaling. Um, doesn't mean innovation ends, obviously, but, you know, it, it's, it kind of creates a whole new problem. Yeah, so ne next question uh, for three of you. Um, you know, when we talk about recycling, well, JB, I really appreciate, you know, you, you, you analyze this, you know, the uh, material shipping to battery manufacturing, and then you ship to the car, and, and how do you co-locate those, right? And, and look at the whole uh, circular e economy, you know, how, where the costs come from. Um, so one question related to recycling, and this might all, all the way from starting manufacturing the cell. Do you, do you see and how we design the cells can help the recycling better? You know, so at, at this moment, right, recycling, shipping lithium-ion battery turned out to be that's a uh, kind of 50% of the recycling uh, cost right now uh, as one example. Uh, so this is the safety requirement, you know, to do shipping and, and so on. Uh, we designed the cell from the beginning and recycling this relationship. Did you see opportunity right there? There, there is there is some opportunity, but um, having previously kind of worn the hat of you know cell engineer and module engineer and product engineer, you know I, I really don't think that's going to be a, a strong lever for making things more or less recyclable you know, for, for a number of reasons, but, you know, there, there's so much intense pressure to, to improve the product performance and, you know, the product cost and iterate that quickly, that recycling is kind of the bottom of the list of priorities on, on what a lot of these different, um, you know, companies, I mean, even a Tesla, you know, you know, frankly needs to take into consideration when designing the, the whole product. I mean, if you look at some of the modules today, it's almost like you, you you couldn't design it much worse for recycling. It's sort of everything glued together and, you know, it's just utterly undisassemblable. But, you know, I'm not, I don't think that's necessarily wrong because it also minimizes upfront product cost. It makes them more manufacturable and it gives better range, better performance. So, you know, it, we also, of course, have that 10 year lag problem. You know, th this is a, a heavily kind of almost depreciated value of recycling to the, to the manufacturer. You know, so I guess the way I would really look at this is almost more in the chemistry choice and, and not worry as much about the individual cell format or size. But there are some, some pretty fundamental differences, you know, in, in recyclability and, um, you know, that whole kind of closed loop process we can envision with different cathode chemistries, for instance. You know, if you look at, you know, iron phosphate based chemistries versus higher nickel chemistries, you know, they are certainly recyclable but it's much harder to you know, do that you know, economically and to really efficiently recover those metals. So you know, that, that's something to consider. And I, you know, personally, I think if we look at a, a whole future ecosystem where things are really closed loop, you know, I, I personally think that a, you know, one focus more around high nickel chemistry is gonna you know, be more dominant where you can recover that value efficiently, you can recycle it efficiently and, and also have the best product attributes, the best range and, you know, therefore lower, you know, pack cost and things like this. Sure. Um, so uh, in the spirit of this uh, speed dating, uh, let me now uh, maybe throw another uh, question out there. Heiko, you talked a lot about sort of the scientific challenges of developing new chemistry and scaling up. So this is very familiar to me. Um, but Selena, on the cell level, um, that's a little less familiar to me in terms of the scientific challenges. And I want to come back to this uh, sort of overarching question is what can we do on the academic side 
Um, can you maybe give us a few examples of problems that you think, you know, but beyond the cleaning example, um, you know, what kind of scientific problems would you like to see to address, but you don't have time to address in, in the scaling up itself? Uh, you know, give us three problems and I'll, I'll write them down. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so high volume, high speed manufacturing. Um, you're dealing, uh, it's so the, the interesting problems tend to come into things like rheology, you know, things like coding, right? Um, uh, you know, how you lay down a coating smoothly, efficiently, cleanly, consistent coating weight at high speed, at high volumes, um, how you dry those things. Those kind of problems are, you know, super fundamental. Um, they're not usually battery problems. They're maybe handled in chemical engineering, maybe, but it's not really like a big field of study. Um, you run into those problems. Uh, in high-speed manufacturing, a surprising amount of um, uh, fluid dynamics, um, you know, and, and um, airflow issues. You know, you've got a winder that's trying to trying to spin up and wind a, a cell and apply tape and so forth, um, you know, you start in, in getting aerodynamic problems around, you know, how those, uh, how those materials are flowing through the winder, right? And affecting uh, the stability of the, of the winding, right? Which again, you're like, how's that related to a battery? But, you know, it's a, it's, you run into these kind of problems. You run into vibration issues right? And stability of um, your equipment, because you've got a lot of spinning metal that, you know, you've got these coupled assembly lines and all this spinning metal and, um, you know, a little bit of vibration when you're doing some very, very precision welding, for example, you know, we weld the bottom of our tabs. Um, we're welding to micron precision levels, right? If that machine that's doing that welding, because we don't do it while well stopped, we don't stop a line, we do all our processes while things are largely in motion, including welding. Um, you know, how do you handle that kind of uh, decoupling vibration from your, your welding process, right? Um, these are really, in a lot of ways, very fundamental engineering problems that appear in many, many disciplines. Um, you know, and I, th I tend to think of the mechanical engineering ones, that's my background. Um, but they're applied in a different way. Um, they're not, you know, you're not talking about, uh, lift on an aircraft wing you're talking about lift on a piece of foil right so it, it's just a little bit of reframing and i think sometimes that's the thing where you know when we hire engineers we're looking for engineers who have these you know these background disciplines but they can reframe what they've learned into this you know topic area where the problems that you saw in your in your books did not talk about you know a foil flapping right they talked about a wing moving, but it's, it is the same problem. It's just a little different. I, Selena, I, I really enjoy this remark because, you know, at the end of the day, equations are the same. Oh, yeah. uh, even the yeah. actually the dimension of the system might be fully transferable as well. It just, you know, the wing is just much smaller in this case. And Heiko, I couldn't help to notice that you also mentioned a fluid dynamics problem in calcination. I think you were noting um, bringing uh, oxygen for the nickel rich um, calcination as a challenge. So this seems really interesting that perhaps, uh, you know, more experts from mechanical and chemical engineering can really look at these uh, processing a bit more. Um, Heiko, ha have people thought about clever ways to enhance mass transport during calcination? Or is it, are we just talking about putting powder in a box and in a tray and let it go? Uh, are, is BSF thinking about uh, innovations uh, in that regard? Well, definitely we are thinking about that because that is the key to enhance your throughput in the existing equipment, right? So that's a constant task for our research and development team and the engineers in BSF. And indeed, we are using lots of simulation to really model the gas flows in the kiln, the heat distribution and everything to really get the maximum output here. You know? Still, I mean, if there's new ideas out there, highly appreciate it. Yeah? We are taking notes. J JB, I was curious, um, you know, can you also talk about the science questions behind recycling? You know, when I think of recycling, I conjure up this very 
low tech, you know, throw everything in the furnace type of thing. But I think it's, that's a very naive picture. Uh, can you tell us more about the science that uh, still need to be addressed and scientific gaps? Yeah, it, it's uh, a, that, that, that sort of, you know, image of recycling is, is uh, exactly why it's, there's an opportunity, I think, you know, because it's an industry that hasn't typically seen as much technology focus and really science and automation. Um, but it is surprisingly complex to, to do this well. And, um, you know, it really is, you know, manufacturing in reverse. That, that's, that's how I see it. And, you know, I think we're, we need to treat it that way, you know, with the same kind of, you know, rigorous, you know, quality um, measurement and thought, um, you know, and you're, but you're starting with something very complex and making it more and more, you know, simple. So it's, it's a kind of an interesting, you know, uh, reverse, <laughs> you know, process. Um, you know, some of the challenges in specific, you know, are, um, you know, dealing with, you know, these strange, you know, mixtures of materials that don't really occur in nature. You know, you never see nickel and lithium mixed together in nature. You know, it's just a not, not a naturally occurring compound. <laughs> but, you know, this is basically our feedstock. You know, this is the ore. You know, so if you kind of go to the mining, you know, industry and what's worked for 100 years of, you know, nickel deposits, you know, it, it's very different. You know, now we need to figure out how do you recover both of these things that, you know, usually are found, you know, one on a continent, you know, somewhere in, you know, different, totally region, thousands of miles away. Um, you know, so it's, it's you know, it bringing together some different chemical disciplines to, to, you know, focus on those separations and um, managing impurities and, and managing, um, you know, how to, how to make those processes work. Maybe also just to jump in a, really briefly on your question to Selena, I, I cheated and wrote down a few uh, thoughts while she was talking. But, <laughs> you know, so, uh, unintuitive, you know, things that, that come up, um, you know, one, one to me is uh, humidity management. You know, it's a huge capital cost in, in some of these factories and it dictates so much of the infrastructure and, and layout and flow and, uh, you know, just really old technology, you know, that, that you know, you, that you don't see, you know, an incredible innovation happening in dehumidification technology and how to manage that or, or even how to measure and manage moisture ingress into to facilities and things like that. So I think that could be a really interesting area to focus on. Um, also cell seal integrity, not a very sexy thing, but, you know, incredibly important to, to that 10 or 20 year cell life. You know, how do you make an incredibly cheap seal, seal that, you know, doesn't ingress moisture or, you know, outgas, you know, at the same time over that long period of time. Um, maybe also a case and can integrity. You know, that, that's a surprisingly tricky one. Um, you, know, how, you know, if you look at this <laughs> a, a case material that goes around these cells, you know, in a typical EV, you know, you have to guarantee this stuff doesn't have any porosity, has no holes, you know, is you know, cheap and robust for 20 years and yet has square meters of area. Um, big, big challenge. You know, th these are not the sort of sexy, you know, electrochemistry, you know, issues, but they're very fundamental to the performance and cost of that whole system. And JB is teasing me because I, when I was at Tesla, I was chasing rust on cell cans constantly. <laughs> so those are the real issues that, that they are. In the butt. And, you know, it, the whole R&D team goes off and focuses on this stuff for, you know, months and the factory, you know, chases its tail and, you know, you spend a tiny bit of time focusing on some, you know, really advanced, you know, you know, chemistry, you know, innovation, and then a lot of time focusing on some of these seemingly mundane issues, but very this, important. This yeah. is really fascinating to learn about. I think in academia, we rarely hear, hear about these issues, but it sounds like super importance. Uh, we still some time remaining, a little bit time remaining. Let's take some questions from the uh, uh, audience. So the first one, let me uh, read out. Uh, this is for Selena, it's for everyone as well. Uh, you know, this has been discussed many times. Industry consider battery swapping infrastructure. Is this idea still viable, first of all? Uh, and second, you know, what's the, what I added some of my thought as well. So if this idea, exercising this idea, how does that change the, the scaling issue? Uh, uh, yeah, any comments? I mean, yes. I, I can jump in on that one maybe quickly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, next, go. It's exciting. 
it, it's still, I mean, technically this works. There's no doubt whatsoever that you can swap batteries, you can build a car in a pack that'll do it, but I don't think it makes sense. And, you know, really, you end up with such a complicated infrastructure in a, in a you know, management system for this. Um, and you drive a lot of cost into the vehicle and pack design, you know, to allow it. Um, and as fast charge gets better and better, you know, the need for this just continue, you, you just narrow that window. So I think, you know, there's a very, very few applications that are maybe fleet based that have really centralized, you know, depots where they come back to and are managed as a close fleet where it might make sense. But even that, in my view, is, is not making much sense. And, you know, I think we'll focus much more on, on fast charge and, um, you know, trying to, uh, you know, to, to sort of size the battery in a way that it gets utilized really efficiently in its application. Well, except that, um, you know, for cars, I, I agree, I agree with JB, by the way, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. But at Uber, we looked at this for bicycles and like Gogoro does this in Taiwan with um, scooters, right? Mm -hmm. They're in the city and they have a bunch of area, like kiosks where you can swap out your battery pack, right? If you're um, a part of the, the system. And, you know, we, like I said, we looked at this for e-bikes that are, you know, running kind of in a, in a, um, uh, a shared fleet, right? Where, you know, the bicycle pack could get dropped into a kiosk and pull, and you could pull a fresh one and, and put it on the bike and go. But that's a fleet, as JB said, that's a, uh, an owned fleet, right? That's maintained mm -hmm. by a, um, an outside vendor. At that point, it kind of makes sense, but a bicycle pack is about yay big and you can kind of create a lock and you can just personally, you know, pick it up and shove it into a bike and, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, harder, much harder to do economically with um, a car. And you got to remember too, when, you've, when you're swapping batteries, you have to make more of them because yeah, yeah. you have to have them all in these depots, right? So if you're looking yeah. even for an e-bike and you're going to set up a system, a city network, you're not having one battery per that bike. You're going to have two or you know, 1.7, or there's going to be some optimal number depending on yeah. how you've distributed your fleet. So you've got to make more. Yeah, it makes sense. This is a key point. I often also remind other people, by doing small thing, you need to have a backup somewhere, right? <laughs> you need to make more. Uh, so uh, next question, uh, Will, do you want to uh, ask or you want me to? Sure. Um, let me ask uh, this another question here on the decision-making process between recycling, repurposing, and, um, uh, and remanufacturing, right? So uh, I think today we heard from JB on recycling. So um, uh, this question asks, how do you make the decision between, do you send something to the recycler or do you, uh, you know, combine a couple of modules together to make a new pack? Or do you send it off for uh, second life applications for grid storage? How is that uh, decision being made today? Do we, do we have the tools to make it? Um, maybe just, just quickly uh, not try and answer it. Um, you know, ultimately everything, you know, <laughs> has to get recycled, you know? So I, you know, I'm in full support and, and totally agree that, you know, we should be trying to reuse as many components as we possibly can. In, in whichever way possible. And I think the first thing we'll see with automotive modules and packs is some sort of, you know, almost factory refurbishment um, and, and kind of recycling back into a warranty reserve fleet. You know, we already did that, you know, at Tesla and that was, you know, quite viable. Um, you know, it saturates pretty quickly though. And as soon as these things start coming in higher volume, you know, you, you won't have as much demand there. Then, then there's, you know, sort of component harvesting you know, and a lot of mechanical components, you know, can get reused and have a much longer life than maybe the electrochemical, you know, pieces of the cell and module. So, you know, for instance, a bus bar, you know, there's no reason you shouldn't, you know, remove a bus bar and find a way to reuse that. And, you know, perhaps the second pack that a vehicle might use in its life, you know, but that could go to electronics and contactors and, you know, enclosures and many other parts. Um, you know, this is where maybe some of that design for, for reuse might actually be more impactful sooner, I think. Um, and then to the whole second life topic, you know, this is a really, you know, hot issue. And I know there's several startup companies focusing on this. You know, I think part of the, the challenge here is that, you know, today, 
a large scale, large format EV pack actually has a negative value. You know, it costs money for people, for the most part, to dispose of it. So appropriately. So, so people go to enormous lengths to figure out how to keep that thing from, from being, you know, written off or disposed of. You know, if you can find a way to put it into second use of any form, even for a couple of years, you delay a cost, you know, and push out a cost. In the end, I believe that, you know, we'll be able to turn that into a residual value, a pretty large residual value for that battery pack. And I think that will change the decision criteria quite a lot when you're looking at, you know, okay, I could recycle this and recover raw materials and reuse them and get, you know, X thousand dollars or, you know, push this into a secondary application and see how you, how much value you can derive from that. My personal feeling is that the secondary st storage, second life stuff is, is going to be a struggle to scale. I, I don't think that's going to compete all that well with purpose design products in that space. And, and I think, um, you know, we'll see more of those products going into recycling reuse route so that you can quickly recover the materials and put them in a new product. Yeah, so, so it's AP. I have me? to agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then I'll go ahead. Yeah, I agree with that too because you know you design your cells too for the the application, right? So something a cell that's really designed to be great in a you know personally owned vehicle is really optimized for a certain kind of life. It's you know a certain number of cycles, a certain amount of rest time, makes for a great car. It doesn't usually make for a great stationary storage battery pack. You could do it that way but it's really not optimal for it. You'd rather design a cell and, you know, it comes down to how you put, how you put your electrodes together, really not so much even the raw materials. There's something about that. There's some, a bit about the blend, but a lot of it's just how you actually structure the electrodes um, that you'd rather make a cell that's really great for stationary, right? And, and use it as such. The other piece that comes, comes to this, I get out of the fire code work that I do, um, usually when we're making, you know, equipment for something, it goes through uh, any, some kind of a validation process. Um, it goes through a lot of safety testing. For cars, that's a, a lot of testing that, um, you know, crash testing and other stuff that, you know, has been put together by NHTSA to make for good cars, safe, safe performance. For stationary systems, for like a home stationary system, a lot of that means um, listing to something like a UL standard, right? So it's not necessarily so trivial to take a pack you know, and, and I, I always got this question on the fire code, you know, do you want to let people take, you know, and repurpose, you know, a Model S pack and put it on their wall, right? And no, <laughs> no, a Model S pack is designed to be under a Model S, okay? That's the way it's designed to be, and it's, the safety is great. The moment you take it out for the Model S, pick it up and stuff it on your wall, it's a whole different thing, right? And if you're going to put it on your wall, you want it to be, um, designed to be on a wall and manage the safety implications of, you know, being in a residence as a wall mounted thing, which is different, right? So, you know, a lot of the, a lot of these ideas are kind of, they, they look great on paper, but when you actually go in try, try and implement them and try and do this in a mass market way where you've got, you know, proper testing and listing of all these devices, it gets really complicated. So I, I want to jump in a little bit about this, right? So the limitation I understand from engineering design for, for particular purpose, is that the battery cycle life is the main one of the main factors to say, well, you know, if I repurpose that, I don't really know how long it will last. And uh, it just doesn't last long enough. Assuming you have a very long lasting battery, right? 30 years. 11,000, you know, 20,000 cycles. W would that change the, the thinking a little bit, you know, about the JV and <laughs> Selena? <laughs> I mean, I understand there's other factors. It would be good to hear from you, you know, what other considerations are coming in? Yeah. I just think there's kind of a, a fundamental mismatch between what stationary customers want in scale and, and used kind of secondary components. I mean, I, I was, you know, kind of at the beginning of starting and launching our whole stationary energy business at Tesla and, you know, often trying to talk to these customers and sell utilities on this model and businesses and, you know, they want incredible reliability. They want, you know, guaranteed operation for, you know, 20 years, you know, longer than, than you know, we could really even feel comfortable on a chemistry side. And, and to sort of come into that with, you know, well, this is a used piece of equipment, you know, it, it might have a few years left, you know, that 
it, it's not what they really want to hear. On the technical side, though, you know, the, the number of cycles is maybe, you know, uh, yeah, having a 30,000 cycle battery might not be that helpful because most of those applications are looking at daily cycles for renewable energy. So unless you can have a battery that lasts, you know, some en enormous calendar years with very high confidence, that, that doesn't help you that much. And also you have to think, why did it come out of the vehicle application? You know, like what, why, what, what was the you know, impetus to remove it from the vehicle and put it into this second life? <laughs> you know, was it a loss of range? Was it um, technology obsolescence or, you know, you know, something has to you know, happen to sort of have that, that uh -huh. movement uh -huh. in application change. And, and, you know, that's not always the most predictable, repeatable thing, you know, that took it out of the first application and put it in the second. I guess I'd leave it with that. Yeah. So we're coming uh, to the, the final 10 minutes of our time. Um, so I thought I, I might take the, the, the chair co-chair prerogative and, and come back to another discussion. Um, you know, at Stanford, we're very interested in technology, but we're also very interested in, in the policy aspect, the regulatory aspect, the business aspect. So I thought maybe we can spend the, the final 10 minutes talking a little bit about that. And, um, you know, Heiko, maybe let me start with you. Um, the, the need for a regional ecosystem uh, seems to me quite clear, and, and, and all three of you have highlighted on that. And I'll just pick on the European example. Um, you know, there's been many discussions of bringing battery manufacturing, you know, raw material, synthesis, car manufacturing to, to, to Europe. And, and, and Germany certainly is, is leading that effort. Um, can you discuss a little bit on what do you wish to see more on the political or regulatory side and, or the business side to, to, to make this happen, to have this regional ecosystem uh, in, in Europe? I think one, one key point is really to make e-mobility also a viable technology for the future is really look into the, the aspect of sustainability, right? And this is something BSF is trying to do as, as good as possible to make sure that all the components that we are providing are produced in the most CO2 friendly way. And if you take our plant in Europe that is currently under construction, both in Finland for the precursor and also in Schwarzheide for the calcination, we are using green energy because obviously we are doing the calcination, which needs a lot of energy, right? And if you do that with, with a coal fired power plant, there's in the end no sense to build an electric car based on that, right? So this is something all the supply chain partners need to acknowledge. E-mobility only makes sense if also the cradle to grave concept is sustainable, right? It doesn't help to only get green electricity to recharge the car. The whole supply chain needs to, build, needs to be built in that way. And that's certainly something governments can foster, can support by regulations, by really looking into that. Yeah, what are really, what is really the CO2 footprint of each component in the car? And then does it really make sense against the combustion car? Yeah. So that should be really something um, countries, governments and policies should drive and support. Yeah. So Heiko, am I correct to say right now, um, the CO2 footprint is not a decisive factor when you choose between process one, process two, process three yet? Uh, or is this something that you already consider seriously as you look at um, the various options? So for, for BSF, this is almost mandatory. So our corporate strategy is heading in that direction. So there's a huge, uh, it, it's a new corporate strategy that is trimming the whole chemical production of BSF into the direction of sustainability to reduce the global CO2 footprint. And we do this in all the segments BSF is working on, right? Not only the battery, materials production, but also all the chemical processes. But for the battery industry, it's of special importance, obviously, to make the whole electric car sustainable as well. But really, it's in our corporate DNA to do the things in the most sustainable way possible. No? JB, it looks like you have something to say. Thank you. Um, I was just saying I totally agree. And I, I think um, that is a really a, a great place where policy could, could help, um, you know, you know make sure that the industry is growing in, in the right way. And, you know, the sustainability of, of the product manufacturing and the, you know, components that go into it, the materials, 
um, you know, it is really where the biggest, you know, embedded CO2 footprint is of a lot of these things. And, and it can make a big difference. I mean, we, we studied this pretty deeply at, at Tesla and we're, we're studying it really closely at Redwood now. Um, I mean, you can have a, you know, a car, as you said, you know, built off coal power. If you, you know, do everything with coal power, you know, it, it you know, it's still maybe marginally better than a internal combustion car, but, but not as much. And, you know, on the flip side, if you, you know, build this, you know, build the materials, build the cells, build the, you know, vehicle with, you know, you know solar energy or, or renewable energy, you know, you can dramatically, you know, reduce that sort of recovery time, you know, so that, as the car is being used, it, it has a net positive benefit, you know, from day one. And JB, you bring up this really great point, um, you know, at the Gigafactory, and I believe also at Redwood Material, there's a, a great discussion of using the carbon-free and inexpensive electricity from solar and wind. Can you give us a sense in terms of the overall CO2 footprint, is that making a huge dent uh, in terms of say, recycling or manufacturing uh, just by switching to carbon-free electricity? Um, well, I'll, I'll mention it quick and maybe let Selena chime in too, but, you know, at the Gigafactory, one really interesting thing that, that, you know, we did when we architected the whole thing is we made it all electric. Um, we, we literally did not build a natural gas line to that facility. And, you know, it was, it was kind of a cool benefit we got to do when we built it from a, you know, basically a desert scrub brush field is, you know, said, okay, every single process that goes in this massive facility will have to be electric. Um, so basically there, there's, you know, little to no local emissions at that factory and it makes it much easier to, um, to shift the whole energy source to something sustainable. When you kind of weave natural gas into your process all throughout a facility, it gets much harder to chase it out and, and just shift that away. Um, but it, it does make a difference and, you know, the, the energy consumption of all of these processes, you know, all the way back up to the mine, you know, is significant and it's a significant it, it can be a significant impact. So I think as we start to look at, you know, these terawatt hour scales of production, you know, we have to start thinking about that and, and make sure that, you know, we're not, we're not creating unintended consequences as we go through this whole industrial shift. You know, that, that's sort of why we are in this, you know, situation in the first place is, you know, we created some unintended consequences that despite a lot of smart people looking at it, we, we kind of missed it. And we're trying now rapidly to, to, to remediate that. Yeah, um, JP's right. There's there's no natural gas. It's all electric. It, it gets entertaining sometimes, I will be honest with you, but it also sets the factory up for the future um, because we can bring on more and more renewables around the factory to to supply that power. Um, and that's uh, and that's great because, um, you know, we're getting more and more opportunities to do um, clean electric. You know, Panasonic is this big multinational. It's it's a big company. Does a lot of things. Does a lot of consumer products um, all over the world. Uh, you know, it, one of the things that I love about Panasonic was um, the original founder had um, uh, Mr. Matsushita had a had a philosophy that you know he he thought deeply about um, what's what's the purpose of a business person, right? Um, you know, what's your what are you supposed to do? as a business person, what's your responsibility? And um, his viewpoint was that the purpose of a business, of a business person is to bring prosperity. And this was written about, you know, 50 plus years ago. So you'll have to excuse the older language, but to bring prosperity to the community, to the nation, to the world. And, you know, prosperity is not a, a word that we use that much right now, but what does it mean? It really means that, you know, it, you're improving people's lives, you're making them, comfortable, uh, pleasant, enjoyable. That's what prosperity really means. Um, and so, you know, if you think about prosperity in a big way, that includes sustainability because um, you're not living a prosperous life if you're dealing with climate change. In fact, it's kind of uh, antithetical to prosperity for, uh, for, for a world. Um, so this is something that, you know, Panasonic thinks about overall and globally and, you know, drives the, um, drives the corporate philosophy. So, you know, when we look at recycling, we look at sustainability in the factory. Um, it's part of the goal of the business is to develop, is to make sure that, yeah, you know, it's not about, um, 
just the financial return on the business. It's on the prosperity return for the community, for the world, for the business. That's really what it's about. So that's, that's important. And then, you know, if you think through from that, uh, all kinds of things like, you know, being efficient with energy, being efficient with resources, recycling, uh, not producing lots of CO2 on a process if you don't need to, if you can do this in a different way, that all fits with that. Thank you to Mr. Mustashita. That's a really well said, Selena. Thank you. Um, Eve, maybe uh, back to you. Oh, JB, sorry. Did, it, did you want to ask something as well? I'm good. So we, we are coming to the uh, close to the end of this panel. Why don't we do this? We, we have I mean, thousands and thousands of graduate students, uh, you know, early career people listening. Uh, can uh, each one of you giving your one minute or less concluding remark you want to share with uh, young students, you know, what's important, you know, just anything in your mind right, right now, but less than one minute, yeah. We're hiring. <laughs> Send us your resume. <laughs> that's equally good. <laughs> I think that's all, all of us, right? Well, I'm sure JB is hiring as well. <laughs> I, I mean, it's an exciting industry. And I think, you know, there, there's a ton of opportunities for people, um, you know, just graduating or, or, you know, coming close to that. You know, I guess I would encourage people, and we've touched on this before, to, but to look at and, and pick up understanding and knowledge along the way for, for production processes. You know, you know, take one or two classes in that or just have a little bit of visibility in that, even if you're a research scientist or, or someone deep in a technical field, I think that's really helpful so you can speak the language there. And, and for people on the industrial side of things, you know, starting to, to really realize that, you know, we're trying to industrialize something that's innovating so fast. So process automation, controls, data, you know, and that blend of chemistry and, and high volume production is a really interesting area. Um, all, the, all the aspects of that are uh, super fascinating. Heiko? Uh, yeah, I can, I can add to that. I mean, this whole industry is so super agile and things are happening so fast, right? So on the one hand, you need to keep up your curiosity, right? You need to love to enter a roller coaster because it's always going up and down very fast, right? <laughs> Sometimes things are upside down. And what, what to me is most fascinating is really this combination of permanent innovation and having the eye of, to the production and really being part of the big change of society. Yeah? So that's really fascinating to be part of such a new industry it's not a new industry, but it's now a new application field, right? <laughs> <laughs> and th this doesn't happen too, too, too often in our industry ages nowadays. Yeah? So it's really fun to be part of that. And yeah, also BSF is always looking for, for talent that are creative and inspiring the old guys in the company, right? So. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'll pass this back to where do you want to conclude Will? Sure. Uh, well, I just had, like to take a moment and repeat what I said uh, in the beginning of our session here that um, Selena, Heiko, and JB, you guys are moving the needle one step at a time, uh, slowly but surely. So I'd like to thank you for doing this and, uh, and also thank you for hiring our graduate students and postdocs and giving them <laughs> a real job uh, so then we as academics can have impact as well indirectly. Um, so with that, let me uh, ask um, Justin or Evan, maybe we can uh, queue up the slide, please. So this has been a very interesting session as part of our X equals question mark uh, for Storage X. And following this excellent uh, symposium today, we will have another one in which X is going to equal to heat. So we talked a lot about batteries and electrochemistry, uh, we talk a lot about the need for low cost storage and heat is one of the very strong contender in this area. Uh, so we are going to be joined uh, by our um, uh, colleague, Bob Laughlin, uh, who is a professor of physics uh, at Stanford uh, and also uh, one of our alums, Andrew Ponak, who uh, co-founded Antora Energy. And both of them are working very actively in looking at heat as an energy storage medium. So with that, I'd like to thank our uh, participants one more time and, and E and 
all the staff who was making this happen. And thank you all for listening in. Have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye.